Recent research into how the human brain works is inspiring classroom techniques and activities. Accelerated learning and multiple intelligences draw broadly on our growing knowledge of the brain. Probably within the next 10 years, virtually all schools will consider learning how to learn, mind mapping, reading, learning th thinking skills and so on, just to be a normal part of the curriculum. In the way we think of standard note-taking now as normal, this new field will become normal within 10 to 15 years. Tony Bazan is a popular and widely read author on learning and the brain. In March 2004, Tony hosted a day of workshops and seminars which introduced staff and children from Kent to whole brain accelerated learning techniques. Leonardo da Vinci said that number, well, two things had to be done, numbering two. One was that you had to develop your senses. So to teach a child, you had to develop all the child's senses. The second was you had to realize that everything connects in some way to everything else. The different things that we are now finding out about the brain are not, it's not just memory. It's the fundamental building blocks for how our brains work. It's all the senses that we need to be looking after and nurturing with the children. It's all the intelligences. How many senses do we have? Kaz White, a presenter from educational training outfit, Positively Mad, gave a demonstration of multi-sensory teaching methods. First of all, there are five senses that we use a little bit all of the time. Of those five senses, there are three that we use the most for learning stuff. However, of those three, there is likely to be one that you have a personal preference for. Now, the one that you prefer might be different to the person next to you. People have an individual preference which affects how they learn. Let me show you what I mean. Some people learn best by what they see. Some people like to look at things, they like to picture things, they like to see just what it looks like. These people are called visual learners. What are they called? Visual learners. Fantastic, but I tell you what, not everybody learns that way. Other people learn quite differently. Other people learn best by what they? Yeah. Fantastic, they like listening, they like talking, they like listening, they like talking. These people are called auditory learners. What are they called? Brilliant, but I tell you what, not everybody learns that way either. There's another group of people, and sometimes we've forgotten about them in the past. But these people learn in a different way, and it's important to make sure we remember them as well. These people learn best by what they by what they do, by what they touch, by what they feel. These people like a little bit of action. When they get a little bit of action, they get a little bit of activity, learning is much, much easier. And they've got a cool name. They're called kinesthetic learners. What are they called? Kinesthetic learners. Fantastic. We know that the brain has multiple ways of processing information and that as human beings, unless we suffer brain damage, we all have the capacity to process information in different ways. So we're not simply specific types of learner, a visual learner, a verbal learner, a kinesthetic learner, although we may have preferred styles of learning. It doesn't mean to say that we should emphasize the styles of learning that we seem to prefer. We need to exercise all styles of learning and teaching learning that focuses on multiple ways of learning will in the end cater for the needs of a mixed ability class more successfully. And to me, if I want everybody to learn, the best thing I can do is do a little bit of all three. If I do all three, everybody gets to learn and learning becomes memorable for everybody. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Right now, we're gonna learn something using all three. Can I just check, can anybody here count to 10 in Japanese? Ooh, a couple of people, a couple of people. I tell you what, we're going to make sure everybody here can count to 10 in Japanese, including all of the adults. Now, first of all, we're going to do it in an auditory way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the number in English, and then I'm going to ask you to say the number in Japanese back to me when I say it. So number one, itchy. Itchy. Number two, knee. Knee. Number three, sun. Sun. 
Run. Number four, she. She. Number five, go. Go. Number six, Roku. Roku. Number seven, Shichi. Shichi. Number eight, Hachi. 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 Number nine, Ku. Ku. Number ten, Ju. Ju. Now that's one way to do it, but I reckon we can have a little more fun with that. Can everybody imagine they are Japanese sumo wrestlers? <laughs> And a way to say, itchy! Itchy! It does feel good, you can try it. Ni! Ni! Sun! Sun! She! She! Go! Go! Rocko! Rocko! She! 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 Ku! Ku! Ju! Ju! Very good. <laughs> this time, imagine you're a posh lady going to a show. Boys in your high voices, men as well, thanks. Here we go, itchy! People who are more auditory, you guys are starting to feel quite happy because you heard me say the words, you heard everybody else say the words, and even better, you said the words yourselves. One of the, the main problems for education around the world is the, the teachers are leaving it in droves. Now, why? Because they're tired, they're stressed, they're bored on many levels. And one of the reasons why is, is that they're using teaching techniques <clears throat> which are not congruent with the way the, the brain works. So the children get bored, the teacher gets bored, then the teacher leaves and the children leave, and then we say something's wrong. Something must, education cannot be like that. Everybody knows that the baby learns, that everybody who takes up a new hobby is passionate and excited. It's what learning is all about, is passion and excitement. The visual people, you're like, Kaz, you said we were going to do something visual. I need something to look at. I need something to look at, I need something to visualise, and then I can get this much more easily. So for the visual people, on the next flip chart are the numbers 1 to 10. Next to the numbers are the words in Japanese. When I turn the page, I want you to repeat them after me. Here we go. Number one. Multisensory pedagogies are supported by research which reveals that seeing and hearing together works better than just seeing something and then just hearing it. Professor John Geek studies images of the active brain. Well, the interesting thing about the brain is that it's wired for multisensory processing. A lot of the work being done in Oxford about multimodal processing has found that there are projections from the different sensory parts of the brain to each other. So the auditory cortex here talks to the visual cortex, and the visual cortex talks to the motor cortex, and so on. Right now, you need a little bit of activity, because if you do a little bit of activity, it's going to make this so much easier. So can everybody take their hand in the air, please? Everybody, and here we go. What I'd like you to do for number one and two, I want you to say, scratch your itchy knee. Everybody, scratch your itchy knee. One more time. Scratch your itchy knee. Fantastic. Now, I want you to imagine it was actually happening earlier. The sun is coming through the window, so point to a window and say, San. San. And then politely point to a woman and say, She. She. Let's put three and four together. We have... San, she. One more time. San, she. Nicely done. Hand in the air from the top. Scratch your itchy knee. San, she. Now number five is go. It's not quite time to go, but I want you to make a small, subtle movement towards the door as if to go. Everybody? Go. go. Stay there. Imagine you're a 1970s rock guitarist. And I want you to rock you. Everybody? Rock Fantastic. Let's do five and six together. We're going to go, go rock you. Brilliant. Let's go back to the, the top. Number one. Hand in the air. These Scratch new your... pieces of information, these new knowledges that are pouring off the brain presses are actually saying the child learns more when it's having fun and when the teacher's having fun. The child learns more when imagination and association are involved. 
the child learns more when its multiple senses and multiple intelligences are involved. So now we've got the Roku and there's Shiti. I want you to imagine you've got a very twitchy nose. It's because of its nose and it's going to make you do a double sneeze on both sides of your hand. You're going to go Shiti. Everybody? Shiti. Ooh, your hand is covered in slimy stuff. <laughs> Wipe it, not on your friend, on your own. Hatchy. Everybody? Hatchy. So seven and eight together we have Shiti. Hatchy. One more time. Shichi. Hatchy. Back to number five. We're going to go. go Roku. Shichi. Hatchy. From the top, hand in the air. Scratch your itchy knee. Sam she. Go Roku. Shichi. Now, number nine and ten. Number nine, I want you to imagine there's a beautiful flock of doves flying about the room. I want you to call one down by going, coo. Everybody? Coo. Now, grab one because they're made of toffee. Take a bite. Instead of saying two, I want you to go, ju for number ten. Everybody? Ju. So, nine and ten together. We have, coo. One more time. Coo. That's looking good. From number seven, the double sneeze, we have, Shi chi, ha chi, koo Back to number five. Number five, we're going to go rock Shi chi, ha chi. We know that simply working with a computer or simply working through writing or simply working through copying from the board or simply working through a series of uh, s examples is not sufficient to enga fully engage the cognitive functions and all areas of intelligence. We need to have multiple ways of challenging children and of presenting and communicating uh, what we've learnt to each other. Uh, so a brain-based approach is a multi-sensory approach because that mirrors what we know of human thinking and how the brain works. I have an incredible memory. I'd like you to take the hand, I'd like you to shake the other hand and say, well done me. Well done me. Research into the way the brain works points to the need for integrated thinking. The model which separates right brain and left brain functions has been superseded by evidence that interconnectivity is the key to better learning. The secret behind everything we're doing this morning is the entire morning we are going to use both sides of our brain. Because when you use both sides of the brain learning is much faster and much easier. We're going to do group information using colour, we're going to use keywords and pictures and we're going to put it all together. And we're going to put it all together in a special, special way and that's called a mind map. Has anybody here heard of a mind map? Mind mapping is a graphic technique which is claimed to offer learners an overview of a large subject in an efficient, enjoyable and memorable way. Now this is a mind map of Marco Polo. Has anybody here heard of a country called China? Fantastic. Anybody heard of Marco Polo? No, I just want a few people to know a few things. I'll tell you what, we're going to find out all about him. Now first of all, Marco Polo, his last name has been drawn like a packet of... Polo. Do you think they had Polo 700 years ago? No. no, but they probably wish they did. But it helps us remember his name because it's a little bit strange. Now, Marco Polo travelled to China when he was 17 years old. Marco Polo travelled to China when he was 17 years old. That journey took him three and a half years just to get there. A long time to travel. Three and a half years just to get there. It was a total distance of 5,600 miles. How many miles was it? 5,600. Excellent, thank you. Now he went with his father and his uncle, he went with his father and his uncle, um, this is his father and this is his uncle, um, and they had to cross the Gobi Desert. Now when I first heard that, I hadn't actually heard of it before, and I thought, how can I remember that? This is what I did. I want you to imagine you have a bee in front of you, Bzzz, and then you want to point to the bee, point to a door, and I want everybody to go, go bee, everybody, go bee. Why does a mind map have an image in the centre? and not a word. Yeah, because an image is imagination, so it's part of memory, and a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Whenever you're teaching the kids in the class geography, history, English, mathematics, whatever it is, image in the center. Before he left China, he made friends with the Chinese 
emperor. The Chinese emperor was a very powerful man and he gave him a golden tablet. The Chinese emperor gave Marco the golden tablet because the golden tablet worked like a passport. If somebody went to stop him, he would show them the golden tablet. They would see the golden tablet and go, oh, uh, you're friends with the emperor, not going to mess with you then. When he got back, he wrote a book about how amazing China was, but no one believed him. They only believed him last century. When did they believe him? Last century. Brilliant. When he got back to Italy, when he got back to Italy, he lived in Venice. He lived in Venice. Venice is where the houses are built on stilts and they're all kind of sinking into the sea. All of this happened. So my mapping is based on two main things, imagination and association, which are the principles on which all the brain's major functions work. So in a mind map, you have, as you have in the, the map of a city, the center and the main roads running out, in a mind map you have the central image and the main rivers, roads of thought emanating from that, and from those the second level roads, from those the third level roads, and so on. So you actually end up with a map of the interrelationship of your thoughts to themselves. It's like an internet in your mind. And it's the way the brain thinks anyway, so it's nothing new to it. It's actually coming home. Can we give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Right. Brilliant. Now, what I'd like everybody to do is just turn to the person next to you in twos and threes to stay where you're seated. Tell each other everything you know about Marco Polo, please. Yes. Uh, he travelled to China. It took three years. Three and a half. Three. And he travelled there at 17. Brilliant. Now, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to ask everybody some questions. Everybody some questions. So, first of all, everybody, can you tell me, how old was Marco Polo when he went to China? 17. Excellent. How many years did it take him to get there? Three and a half. Nice one. How many miles was the journey? Teaching the skills of mind mapping gives a tool for making thinking visual, making it explicit, and sharing it. So, it's an important tool for thinking. It doesn't replace the thinking, although it can be a framework and a strategy for generating ideas, connecting ideas, and seeing relationships. If I had given you the same information like this, it wouldn't be one page, it would be at least two pages. Do you think you would have remembered as much as easily? However, the truth is, sometimes at school you need to get information like that. Sometimes in life we need to get information like that. However, if you want to take information like this and make it much more memorable, make yourself your own mind map. I actually foresee a time when the teaching profession will be swamped with people. Because who wouldn't love a job where you were having fun every day, where everybody was learning fantastically, where most children were getting A's just like that because memory and creativity were natural to them. Amongst those attending the Learn to Learn conference were staff and pupils from Charing School. Head teacher Rosemary Olley was looking for ways to improve teaching and learning at her school. The children really enjoyed it because they were, it was incredibly interactive. Um, they got a lot of fun out of their learning. Um, and they liked the energy that they saw and uh, so they came back buzzing with it but the other thing it did was energise um, the staff and one of my staff in particular, the year six teacher, came back and said I can use that, I can make that work and that's how we started on the road that we're on now. Okay, last week we went on a site visit over the road. The year six teacher inspired by many of the teaching tools demonstrated at the conference was Anne Plummeridge. Today, Anne is using mind maps to help the children gather and organise information following a visit to a local building site. In a future lesson, the class will be asked to form their own opinions about the environmental impact of the development. Uh, the lesson was based on a geography lesson that we've been doing about um, looking at the environment and a traffic issue in a local area. So we decided that we would use um, the new building development that was taking place over the road from school, using um, that as our geography for this term. So, OK, I'm going to ask in a minute, I want you to mind map exactly what you have now discovered about the school road development.
I use mind mapping a huge amount. It's a really versatile means of recording things. Um, for this kind of lesson, it's more information gathering. So it's bringing together all the children's ideas, but it gives them a very visual way of being able to record it themselves. And then we bring together all their ideas on a class mind map. And then that can be used as a record of the class's work. And it can be put up with the displays that are already up. Now from there I want you to take it and I want you to put in all the things that you know now about the site from our visit and from what you learned by talking to Kay Martin when she came in to answer your questions. Okay, you've got your questions in your book so you should be able to find them. You have about five minutes to do this, okay? A lot of the children find this a much easier way of recording than a lot of other ways. Um, some children have a great difficulty with writing, especially the special needs children. Um, and to them it's a chore and it's one that they dislike. Uh, and if you can find other ways to help them record things, then um, they'll learn a lot more and a lot quicker. I'm very impressed with the mind maps you've been doing. They're really very good at the moment. So what we're going to do now is you're going to tell me the information that you've got on your mind maps and we're going to put them onto the class mind map at the front and then that can be used when it's completed to put along with the display that we've already got to do with the geography work that we've been doing. Okay, so who's going to start me off? Ashley. Fit in with the surroundings. fits in with the surroundings. Very often they'll use it as a class activity to start the theme, but they'll also use it on an individual level when they're doing story writing, for example, or a more creative piece of work to get them into the thinking process and the planning process. I think my left side of my brain was used more because we didn't know about mind maps and now it's helped me to use both. It helps me order my work a lot better. Like if you're writing a story, you can put all your ideas down instead of putting it in a list and waiting till the end. I like using a lot of colours and if I use colours, it sticks in my brain. We've been using our mind maps um, to write down what we know about a topic in science before we start it and what we know about it after we start it. You can like revise with it by looking at it like five times, then it gets stuck in your long-term memory. As well as aiding pupils learning at Charing, mind maps are benefiting teachers. The teachers have used it as a method of planning, um, medium-term planning in particular they've used it for. Um, and my year six teacher at the moment uses it for weekly planning to show the children what they're going to be doing during the week. And she also asks them to add anything to this mind map in case they think that they could um, do other strands of work alongside the things that she's already planned. For quite a few years we've been uh, having to teach in boxes. We've had, um, this is a subject for maths and that's ICT and that's DT. And the children have actually had to think in those boxes. They've not been allowed the freedom to move between one subject and another. So consequently, they can't transfer the skills they learn in one subject over into another subject area. The cross-curricular planning and learning and the mind mapping allows them to do that. Lindsay? There are going to be seven blacks. Kayleen? There's going to be very small gardens. Very small gardens. In front of two of the shops, there was going to be a car park. Who for specifically? Claire. Anne's cross-curricular approach does seem to reflect the associative way in which the brain works. I think the big key word would be interaction rather than separateness. Uh, taking opportunities to show connections, parallels, analogies between areas of curriculum. Secondly, would be revisiting areas in a spiral way so that we're putting in some reinforcement. It has to be in different contexts, otherwise it'll clearly be boring. But we do want to be leading our children in schools towards independence so they feel confident and independent about what they're knowing. Daniel. 
There was meant to be no access from the school road. Claire. Some steps and a slope. The bricks on the old houses match the new houses. There were several children in the class last year who had quite large problems with recording work and the way they understood it. Um, and for them, this was a lifeline um, because they can use pictures to help with the key in certain words. They don't have to actually read screes of, of writing. And the way that they learnt with the revision was just to do the, the mind maps and then they could look through them in their own time as well. And um, it just sticks because of the use of the colours and the pictures and the way it's designed. It just works. I wouldn't use the term accelerated learning. I would, I would call it more enrichment learning and I would call it it's definitely cross-curricular learning. We're trying to make sense of their schooling and their learning by making it more of a cohesive unit um, with more things interlinked so that they can see um, how one thing impacts on another. Of course, it's important that accelerated learning doesn't come at the cost of depth of learning. What really is important in learning is are the inner purposes is the deeper understanding that only comes through time and through the uh, experience of uh, reflection and the experience of critical and creative thinking about real problems uh, that deepens understanding. Well, I think we've done an awful lot on here. You found an awful lot of information and a really good mind map at the end of it. What I would like you to do, though, is to think about all the things that you've learnt from the visit to the site and what your first thoughts were when we discovered that we were building over there. I'd like you to actually write about how you feel about this development now in light of going into the site and having a look. So that's what your homework for tonight will be. Okay? One of the issues we had was that we were a school with serious weaknesses and teaching and learning was not good in my school. Um, now it's been proved to be good because our results went up. Now we can't ever say that it was a, as a result directly of using mind mapping, but we think, um, certainly from the feedback that we had from some of the boys, that they liked that method of learning. And we've hooked some of them, we think, into that, which gave them success. My teachers have found it quite liberating working with a thematic approach to what they deliver within the classroom.